I was going to say, you know, you know your laparoscopic uh, career has hit rock bottom when you get invited to SAGES and talk about uh, managing patients with uh, loss of abdominal domain. And what I thought I would do is uh, take you through what happens uh, when one of these patients with a massive hernia and, uh, you know, essentially no real abdominal domain, what my uh, treatment algorithm is for these patients. So uh, for this morning, uh, three uh, objectives to get through is trying to find what exactly uh, does it mean when you see a patient in your office, who has loss of domain, who does not. And then probably the tougher question is, should we even be repairing these patients? And if you get past that question, trying to choose what the right operation is uh, for the right patient. So if you look through the literature, there really is very little written about loss of abdominal domain, and there are very, very few studies that have tried to define it. I think in, in simplest terms, it means that there's more abdominal viscera outside of the abdominal cavity than is inside of the abdominal cavity. There have been attempts to measure that volumetrically with CT scans, but the problem that you uh, wind up with is, is that while somebody's straining, is that while somebody's lying flat, uh, so it's very difficult to look across the literature and understand what studies are looking at loss of abdominal domain and, and, and what are not. So in my practice, the way I define this problem, the way that I look at each one of these patients is based on this classification system. And I think that this is important <clears throat> because it helps me think about what the uh, reconstructive options are for these patients. So what I like to do is I break the patients up into the first break of whether there's contamination or not. And then within each one of those groups, there's another subdivision of how big is the hole of the hernia, and then how big is that mushroom cloud and how many things are coming outside of it. So when you break up abdominal domain in that way, there's basically two groups. Again, there's the non-contaminated group, and then there's the massive inguinoscrotal patients that actually have a small hernia hole, but a huge hernia sac, and in this patient, Really, the primary thing that you're up against is finding peritoneal space to get everything back in. The reconstruction is actually not that challenging. And then you have a patient over here with a massive hole and a huge hernia sac coming out. And obviously, they're not only going to have peritoneal space problems, but they're also going to have reconstructive challenges trying to get the muscles back together. And then you have the same group uh, for the contaminated patients. And obviously, this is a very, very challenging group of patients because a lot of your options are limited when you have the fistulas, uh, the infected mesh, and, and other uh, contaminated problems. So before we talk about whether or not we should fix these patients, I, I think when you look at the quality of life <clears throat> of these patients, they're absolutely miserable. When you don't have your abdominal uh, core muscles, there's a lot of back pain issues, there's stretching of the mesentery, edema of the bowel, and these people are absolutely miserable in their quality of life. So why should we not fix these? Well, I think this is one operation where you have to check your ego at the door and say, if you've never done this, these patients have one chance to get this right, and this is not something you should do every once in a while. This, these patients probably should be seen by somebody who does this quite a bit, and I can give you a few of my friends phone numbers if you'd like to send them to them. <coughs> um, but the other thing is, probably the harder question is, can the patient tolerate the operation? And I'll give you my next slide, who I think cannot tolerate this. And when I see a patient in the office with one of these problems, the first question that I ask them is, tell me what you do on a typical day. <clears throat> and if you're not going to improve these patients' quality of life, these patients probably should not have these hernias repaired. So who can't tolerate it? Well. I think we're going to have a talk later on the day about morbid obesity, but I think this is one group of patients where you want to try for some weight loss, whether that's a bariatric procedure, which unfortunately is often not feasible uh, given the size of the hernia and other uh, symptomatic constraints. Uh, people with severe lung disease, uh, they, they can die. People die from these operations. So certainly those patients, you want to make sure they're optimized. And I think if you can take anything from my talk today, do not do this operation on smokers. In my practice, you used to get a urine cotinine test, but it's not available anymore. Now I get a serum cotinine test for a byproduct of nicotine. If it's positive, you're canceled off my schedule for six months. It takes two weeks to clear that. I think this is one thing, it's not negotiable. If you operate on these big reconstructions of people in smoking, it's disastrous. And I think I always try and step back when I'm in the OR and understand that sometimes creating the perfect abdominal wall 
can result in patients dying. So sometimes in these operations, it's important to know when to back off and when to just get on first base or second base at most. So once you figure out who you're going to operate on, coming up with the right operation, again, the goals of this operation to me are get everything back in there without abdominal compartment syndrome. And then you want to move past that and start thinking about, a, which is a plastic surgery uh, concept, which is replacing like with like. And that's really rebuilding these people's abdominal wall, which often involves getting the uh, rectus muscles back together in the midline. So when we break it up into two groups, if we start with the non-contaminated cases, I think these are your general options of how to take care of this. Now, laparoscopic ventral hernia repair in uh, patients with large defects and uh, loss of domain, in my opinion, is not a very good idea. It's been described, Bruce Ramshaw has published a paper on it, but uh, I think you should really step back. While these can be done, I'm not sure that you're offering a lot of improvement for these patients. It still looks like they have their hernia. You haven't fixed their core muscles. I think perhaps for the group with the small hole and the big mushroom cloud, there's a role here. But otherwise, uh, I do stray away from that. Pre-op pneumoperitoneum is something that I uh, have an increasing interest in now, and I'll show you a case of that. Tissue expansion. In my opinion, this works much better for stretching the skin than it does the fascia. Uh, and then what I think is probably the most important open reconstructive techniques that we have to offer is this retrorectus stopa type repair. And I think this is probably what I go to 85% of the time uh, when I'm faced with these problems. So just a couple cases. <clears throat> this is a non-contaminated, small hole, big mushroom cloud in a 58-year-old gentleman. He had gastroschisis, had multiple uh, abdominal wall reconstructions as a child and presented to our emergency room uh, in about a three-month period with seven uh, small bowel obstructions. When I saw the CT scan, I, I thought maybe could make it to 10, uh, but eventually did not open up. <clears throat> so, you know, what is loss of domain? I mean, I think you can clearly see it here. There's his abdominal muscles. There's his rectus. And, uh, you know, this is lying flat. Essentially, everything is outside. So obviously a lot of problems here, skin problems, uh, bowel obstruction, loss of domain. Uh, so when I don't know what to do, I, I start, step back for a moment and try and put the laparoscope in people. Uh, so I put the scope in him and put a metaport uh, and then actually started uh, pre-op pneumoperitoneum. Uh, and so this is what it looks like. And <clears throat> what I basically do is I blow them up twice a day. If you look over on the left, that's after a week. You look over on the right, you can actually see you're starting to get some space inside the abdominal cavity to bring all these things back together. Then we take him to the OR, uh, take down all the adhesions. He actually did require a bowel resection uh, in this reconstruction. Uh, and then we did a component separation, and that's a biologic mesh given the uh, bowel resection. Got his fascia back together in the midline. Uh, this is a completed product. Uh, four months after that, he came back with an MRSA uh, abdominal wall infection, but you can actually see there's the fluid collection, but his abdominal wall muscles are still back together. And this is him one year later. And again, this is him in my office, bringing the muscles back together. It's innervated, vascularized tissue. <clears throat> Despite the fact that it was a huge loss of domain, you can reaccommodate these people's abdominal wall and put them back together. So. The next group is the non-contaminated, the big hole and the big hernia sac. This is a guy who's had 11 operations, uh, multiple different patches, uh, and now he's been left with this very large defect. So he gets a stopa operation. This is a clean case, so he gets a synthetic piece of mesh uh, in the retroerectus position. And again, you can't reconstruct these people's abdominal wall, uh, trying to bring things back together in nice wide mesh coverage. And even with a little bit of a bridge, you can still get a pretty good uh, functional and cosmetic uh, result in these patients. Luckily, people in Cleveland don't lose a lot of weight after you operate on them, so uh, <laughs> most of them gain. Um, <clears throat> so we'll wrap up uh, with the uh, contaminated cases. And again, I think these are very, very challenging. I think sometimes you have to bridge with biologic mesh. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, I think when you do, you have to realize that you're going to have to accept a much, much higher recurrence rate. I don't care what the biologic mesh is, all of these, when you look at them long enough, probably about a 70 to 80% recurrence rate, but certainly sometimes that is acceptable and that's what you have to settle for. I think component separation is a great operation, but realize as the defects get very large, uh, 
and the abdominal wall is non-compliant, they're not going to work. It's not going to bring things back together. I'll show you the silo technique that I prefer. <clears throat> and then occasionally we will do distant uh, tissue flaps for these patients. But these are morbid patients, and this is a morbid procedure that you add on. There's often donor site morbidity. And the problem with most of the flaps are they're denervated, they're going to atrophy over time, and you're going to wind up with the same situation that you do with a lot of these biologic meshes as they stretch and it looks like you have a hernia. So this will be the last case. <clears throat> uh, this is this Gore-Tex serial excision, and I basically treat these patients like a gastroschisis, and I pull them back together over time. So a pretty challenging situation here. This is a guy, uh, 48 years old, Crohn's disease. He had a subtotal colectomy, and that's his end ileostomy. He's had three prior hernia repairs with polypropylene mesh that was placed above inner inlay and underlay, and now he's been left with multiple fistulas and a big peristomal uh, hernia. So we took him to the OR, took down the stoma, put back together the bowel, brought his stoma over to the other side. And I know this seems crazy when you see this, but um, what I do in these situations is I put a piece of PTFE mesh just sewn to the fascial edges. Uh, and I don't care how contaminated it is because I'm eventually going to take that mesh out. And I bring him back. I let him recover. And then I start bringing him back to the OR twice a week. And I excise the middle part of the mesh, stretch the mesh back together. You can typically get about four centimeters each time. Uh, it's, it's essentially reverse tissue expansion is what it is. Uh, then I take out the Gore-Tex mesh, uh, and then I'm going to put an underlay <coughs> of biologic mesh, bring the fascia back together, and this is this guy four months later. Uh, and again, here he is two years later in my office, and this is what I like to describe. So I, I'm from Cleveland. I'm a Ohio State fan. I'm going to show you a Michigan sit-up. That's a Michigan sit-up right there. It's the best I can get anybody from Michigan to do. Sorry, guys. Uh, and again, this guy's not doing 100 sit-ups, but uh, uh, pretty decent. So um, <clears throat> we published a paper about this. I would just say this Gore-Tex serial excision is not for the lighthearted surgeon, and it's not for the lighthearted patient. These are very, very complex situations. Uh, huge defects, you know, one month in the hospital. But I will show you, it, it, it's my biggest hernia as I fix and it's my best long-term result, but it, but it uses a lot of resources. It's very difficult. I mostly just show that to show you guys that there are other options, but certainly this is not for the average uh, hernia. So I'll wrap up with that. I think, you know, I think loss of domain is a tough problem. There is not one solution. Uh, I think you have to look at each one of these patients very carefully, uh, figure out who you need to operate on, when not to operate, and when in the operating room just to do the best you can and get out. But certainly these are patients that most of them have one more chance at a functional abdominal wall. Thanks very much.